Uh, tonight we'll do the, uh, well, we'll start on the book of Joel. I doubt that we'll finish that. Maybe, maybe not. But, of course, in Joel, they're talking about uh, uh, repentance and punishment and uh, blessings of obedience and, and what have you. But it's never explicitly, in just so many words said, what the problem was. But if we uh, make the assumption that uh, Joel was written oh, around 800 or so B.C., one of the oldest uh, manuscripts, um, then we can look to the political turmoil that was going on then. And, and there always seemed to be some sort of political turmoil. Now, you guys that have uh, cell phones, <clears throat> I know you'd be tempted to tune in to President Biden's speech tonight rather than listen to me. <coughs> well, <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the uh, date, you know, this time period that, that uh, Joel was prophesying at least what scholars think the time was, puts him in uh, prophesying during the, the, uh, the reign of uh, Joash. Now, Joash was made uh, king when he was only seven years old. And he was a good king until uh, Jehoiada died, the priest Jehoiada died. Then he turned out to be so wicked, he was eventually assassinated by his own servants. Now, that was a pivotal time in, in uh, Judah's history, of course. Jehoshaphat, a uh, righteous man uh, who succeeded him, befriended, befriended Ahab, the king of Israel. He was, of course, we all know he was a bad character, as wicked a man as could be, including his wife. There were families intermarried. As a matter of fact, Jehoshaphat, the two sons had the same names as Ahab. The result of this befriending of Israel is that the idolatry in Israel became more solidly entrenched uh, than it ever was before in Judah. Athaliah, that's Joash's grandmother, had ruled for six years before Joash, and she held sway over Judah for longer than that uh, than that being the queen grandmother to Joash. She, like uh, her mother uh, Jezebel, actively supported and like a missionary, tried to convert Judah to the worship of Baal. So we see that, you know, there's always some sort of political turmoil going on during these uh, time of the prophets. So <clears throat> So what is uh, the message of Joel? He's sometimes called the, the prophet of the Pentecost because, uh, again, given the uh, thought that he was one of the earliest uh, writers, it's the first time, if that's the case, it's the first time that there's ever, ever any mention of a Holy Spirit. And he introduced that concept. Now, we don't really know who this Joel is. The number mentioned, but we don't know which one it is. But nevertheless, it's still a, he's still a prophet of God and he's delivering a message to the people. Now, he's talking about the doom of the nations, those that are evil, of course, and the ultimate glory of Jehovah and his cause. And he will talk about an invading army. And when we get into the uh, verses, we'll find out 
that that army is insects, locusts. Now, you may not be familiar with locusts. I know I'm certainly not. Grasshoppers, I know. Locusts are uh, the same, what do they call them, order, family, whatever, as grasshoppers, but, but they're different. Grasshoppers, you know, I went online and, and looked at uh, the difference between grasshoppers and locusts, and they said grasshoppers only hop, they can't fly. But that's not true. Grasshoppers can fly, but only a short distance. Whereas locusts, when they swarm and fly, they can fly hundreds of miles. They can fly a long distance. And they tend to, uh, when they do that, they tend to swarm. And wherever they land, they just eat, eat up everything. Now, being the country boy that I am, I have seen infestations of grasshoppers such that you could not walk without uh, crunch, crunch. Very seldom I've ever seen that, but I have seen that. Of course, at the same time that I've seen that, I've seen a, a, an explosion of the golden orb spiders, too. And as kids, you know, we always used to have fun grabbing those grasshoppers and throwing them in the, in the web and, and uh, watching the spider do its work. But very seldom have I seen, uh, um, and you don't see it down here so much. Up in, in central Texas, you can, you can see infestations of grasshoppers. And you don't see locusts here. You'll find it over in the Middle East. You'll find it in uh, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. You'll see that from time to time in, in South Africa. And it can be quite devastating. Uh, <clears throat> so let's look at uh, some of the verses here. Let me get my... Again, it does not identify exactly who this jewel is, but, you know, the uh, first verse says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And that establishes the authority. The word came from the Lord. Now he's saying here, hear this, you elders. You know, you that are older, I want you to hear this. Give your ear. Listen to what I'm saying. All you ha inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers. Now we uh, older people always say, you kids, you know, I remember back in our day, it, it was really bad. So he's the prophet is saying, you remember this. Has anything like this ever happened in your days? And I'll answer that is no, it hasn't. To tell your children about it, that your children tell their children, their children uh, another generation. Remember this. Now, there had been some thought that this, uh, these locusts were really people, an invading army, but it's probably not. Probably, actually, locusts. And when you think about that. Here, the prophet is using a natural phenomena, an event, to make a spiritual lesson. We do that today. I mean, there have been many lessons presented here where some sort of um, phenomena in the physical realm, material realm, was used to convey a spiritual message. And, and you have to think of this in that, that uh, light. That these are real locusts, real live locusts. But there's to be a spiritual message to what's being uh, presented here. Since what the chewing, verse uh, 4, what the chewing locust left, the swimming locust is eaten, 
what the swarming locust left, the crawling locust is eaten, and what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust is eaten. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. I went online and looked at the YouTube video of uh, uh, the locust infestation in East Cape, uh, South Africa. And it's really weird to, to look at. It's, I mean, they're just everywhere. If you, when they settle down on the ground, you look at the ground, practically every square inch is, is uh, occupied by a locust insect. So it's, it's really something to behold. Awake you drunkards and weep, and well you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine for it has been cut off from your mouth. Even those things that uh, gave pleasure to the uh, drinkers of wine, and of course the new wine is really the sweet wine, which is really the most desirable. You know, they didn't have uh, too many five pound bags of sugar. So when they could get something that was sweet, that was uh, highly desirable. But they're not gonna have that. That pleasure is gone. For our nation, verse 6, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. Probably still talking about this invasion of locusts. It's, it's like a uh, nation. It's come up against the land, and it's strong. And you can't number them. There's too many of them and the uh, teeth like a lion, they eat everything. They'll eat the bark off a tree. It's been uh, noted uh, by some historians that infestation of locusts, they even ate the bark off the tree. So they made, made the tree bare, so. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He stripped it bare and thrown it away. His branches are made white. They strip everything. Now keep in mind, this is not a message about some, uh, you know, agriculture event. Again, you're using a natural phenomena to make a spiritual message. And of course, you know, with what I gave in the introduction, there was a spiritual problem in uh, Judah and Israel at this time. And he's using this natural phenomena saying that you know, if you don't straighten up, it's going to be bad. This uh, infestation of locusts is bad. You know it's bad. You can see it. But well, if you don't uh, straighten up, repent, and render obedience to the Lord, it's going to be bad. It's going to be worse than this. In verse eight, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband or her youth. The, the new bride whose uh, husband is, for whatever reason, is, is uh, dead, killed in battle, say, uh, she's going to lament for that husband. Same thing here because of this uh, just really dramatic infestation of locusts. People are going to, to lament just like this uh, bride would lament. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn who minister to the Lord. They can't do their job. You know, they're to minister the sacrifices. Or there's not going to be any sacrifices because there's nothing there to sacrifice. It's all gone. The uh, locusts have eaten it all up. And again, if they don't repent, they're not going to be able to perform their uh, sacerdotal functions, if you will, because some other nation's going to rule them. The field is wasted, the land mourns, the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Again, a picture of complete and utter devastation. And likewise, that's uh, what God's judgment will do if they don't uh, repent. It'd be just as devastating. Verse 11, be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers. 
for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished, it's all gone. The vine is dried up, the fig is withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, uh, the apple tree, all the trees are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. <clears throat> the people are going to be, they're not going to have all the things that gave them pleasure in life, fruits and things like that. It's all going to be gone. You're not going to have any uh, joy at all. <clears throat> and that's what's going to happen if you don't repent. It's going to be the same situation. Gird yourselves and lament, you priest. Well, you who minister before the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. They're withheld because there's not any, there's not any grain or you know, wine to offer a, a drink offering. And really, it is the priest who should be leading the people they should be leading the people in repentance. Sackcloth is a, uh, a manifestation of repentance because it's a very coarse cloth and it causes great discomfort. And the idea there is that until one repents and is re restored, there should be no comfort. While well, he's saying here, there's not going to be any. You, you should be doing those things that uh, are... Uh, elements of uh, repentance. In verse 14, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. This is what they should be doing. Now, in, in a uh, infestation of uh, locusts, you know, the, they might want to call uh, a fast. Sacred assembly is called for a specific purpose. Gather all the older wise uh, men, all the inhabitants, call them to the sacred assembly, and then cry out to the Lord for deliverance. In this case, we're talking about deliverance from the uh, locusts, but in a spiritual sense, it's a deliverance from the uh, punishment that awaited them if they did not repent. Verse 15, alas for the, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Again, we mentioned uh, talking about Obadiah, the day of the Lord is a, uh, it can be a day of uh, blessing, but uh, most often it's used as a day of judgment. And usually it's bad. Last for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Well, the punishment's going to come from God. Verse 16, is not the food cut off before your eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? It's because of the locusts. But what about uh, spiritual judgment? Is not the uh, spiritual food going to be cut off? Their joy and gladness also going to be cut off if God, if they don't repent and God punishes them for their disobedience? Well, the answer is yes. It's they're going to they're not going to have joy there either. The seed grain tri uh, shrivels under the clods. Storehouses are in shambles, barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. The locusts have consumed it all. There's nothing there. A lot of times whenever the vegetation disappears also uh, is uh, occasioned uh, with a drought also. So if you, even if you did have seed, it's not going to grow. Verse 18, how the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep, sheep suffer your punishment. Well, under this, this uh, infestation of locusts, since everything's eaten, the cattle have nothing to eat. And since there's also a, 
uh, also the occasional drought. They don't have any water to drink. They're going to suffer too. And that's the um, uh, what sin does. Sin causes suffering. And even those who may not have been engaged in sin because of sin, they may also suffer uh, likewise. Verse 19, O Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has uh, devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. Well, when a, uh, a swarm of locusts goes through, a, let's just say a pasture, they eat everything down and nothing's left is stubble. So they're saying, he's saying here that even that stubble, that stubble is going to burn. Now, I don't know how the fire would start, but it's, it's going to uh, burn. So whatever's left, it's going to be gone too. In verse 20, the beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pasture. <clears throat> this again is a picture of utter devastation, <clears throat> and it's all caused by uh, sin, by Idolatry on the part of the people by lack of repentance. And Joel the prophet is using the occasion of the, this infestation of locusts to demonstrate that clearly to the people. People can see the, the devastation from locusts. Sometimes spiritual uh, infestations, if you will, <clears throat> are harder to see. So he's making comparison. One is just as bad as the other. In fact, one is worse than the other. In chapter 2, <clears throat> it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound a, uh, an alarm in my holy mountain. You have to think of Zion and the holy mountain as, as spiritual realms, not necessarily a physical Zion or a physical holy mountain, but they, they would have to be equated uh, with the same. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Again, that same phrase, the day of the Lord is coming, a day of judgment, for it is at hand, it's close, a day of darkness and gloominess. And this is a, really a description of how bad things really are. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a dark day or not. Of course, when you get an a, uh, infestation of locusts and a swarm, it will cloud the sky. So uh, there's some uh, allusion to the uh, infestation here. A day of darkness and gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be such after them, even for many successive generations. Probably still talking about the uh, locusts, talking about them as people, and how bad it's really going to be, but it still is an allusion to what it will be like if they don't repent. A fire devours them, uh, devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. <clears throat> I mean, it's going to be a complete devastation. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. Prior to the infestation, the land was like, it was very lush and verdant, uh, very productive, kind of like the Garden of Eden. But after the locusts come, you know, you look behind what the locusts have done, behind them a desolate wilderness, surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance shall be like the appearance of horses, 
and you, you can't ignore them. And like swift steeds, so they run. And if you ever seen these swarms of uh, locusts, uh, I mean, it's it, it's not like you can run from them. They're very uh, quick, very fast, and they will overtake. You know, if you try to run from them, kind of like killer bees. You know, you can't uh, you can't outrun them. <laughs> With a noise like chariots, and of course, I've again, I've never seen a swarm of locusts, but looking at it on YouTube, you can actually hear them because <coughs> all those wings flapping, you can actually hear them. With a noise like chariots, over mountains, they leap. Nothing is going to block them, not even mountains. Like the noise of the flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. They're an army that will not be denied. And again, that's the way it will be in judgment. Judgment will not be denied. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. In verse 7, they run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in uh, formation. The people are going to shrink in fear from this invading army of locusts. And it, uh, it'll, the fear will drain them of their color. And these locusts are just like mighty men. They climb walls. Uh, everyone marches in formation. They seem to have one mind. It's a very unusual uh, situation with locusts. Usually, usually they're solitary creatures, but then when they, I don't know, I don't know how they determine it, but when they decide to swarm, uh, it, it's like a mighty army. They don't, it says here, they do not push one another. <coughs> Everyone marches in his own column. And when they lunge between the weapons, and there really are no weapons to, uh, defray the, the damage done by locusts. Locusts do have natural uh, predators, but the thing, the thing is that the numbers of locusts are so overwhelming that you could not gather enough predators in one, one place to take care of the problem. They, they overwhelm the predators. They are not, they are not uh, they lunge between the weapons, they're not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall, they climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. They're everywhere. And so shall it be with the uh, judgment from the Lord. It will be everywhere. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark. And the stars diminish their brightness. It, it's kind of painting a picture here of how really devastating this uh, invasion is. But again, equate this with judgment, with a judgment from unrepentant, uh, unrepentant people. The Lord, in verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army, where his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great, again, this, this phrase, the day of the Lord, is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Judgment will be visited upon these people if they don't repent. They cannot avoid it. And it's a lesson for us today that uh, an unrepentant person is going to suffer punishment. It's unavoidable. It's going to happen. And verse 12, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. He said, he's appealing to them for repentance. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. You know, show some evidence of your repentance. So rend your heart and not your garments. You know, what people would, when they were... Um, Wanted to, wanted to demonstrate their uh, 
sorrow or repentance over something and this, that, and the other, they would tear their clothes. What the prophet is saying is there's got to be something more than that. It's got to be a uh, rending of the heart, a contrite heart. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Now, I think we need to kind of make a, a note about this relenting on the part of uh, Jehovah. If we're not careful, we, we uh, ascribe to him human qualities where, you know, I may be determined to do something, then I relent. But when you're talking about salvation and, and uh, judgment, salvation and punishment, that has always been the case. If one obeys God to, to the extent that he's saved, there's only one place for that, that's, that's heaven. But if he rejects that, there's only one place for that, that's hell. It, it's always been that case. So it's not a matter of God, as, as people would do, changing their minds and saying, oh, I think you're a nice guy. I know you've done all this stuff and you, you still are determined to do that, but I, you know, I, I kind of like you, so I'm going to, I said I was going to punish you, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. There are two sides of the same coin. One is salvation. One is, one is uh, uh, condemnation. It's always been the case. There's only two places that a person can actually go after they depart from this life. There's only two places. There is no middle ground. So it's not a question of God changing his mind as humans would do it. It's a question of people choosing which way they will go. And if, if uh, repentance is, is offered but refused, what's the choice? If repentance is offered and accepted, what's the choice? There's only two choices. There's only two results. So it's not a matter of God as humans would do, relenting. It's the fact that God has put out two choices. And if these people stay in their present condition, they're going to be uh, condemned. But if not, if they actually repent, then they'll be among the righteous and, and saved. And that's really what's meant by God relenting. He's allowing them the choice they will choose, and if they choose obedience, then he, quote unquote, relents from the punishment that awaits all those who are disobedient to uh, to God and, and His gospel. <clears throat> who knows if He will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him? What well, we do know, if one is obedient from the heart, shows contrition and a willingness to submit to his will, we do know that that individual will enjoy the blessings of heaven. And there will be a blessing left behind for him, a grain offering, a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Again, blowing a trumpet is a call to the people. Consecrate a fast, call it a sacred assembly. It's something we, uh, he's, he's mentioned before. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. This is important. Get these people together, this is important. And so it is today, the uh, practice of Christianity is important, not to be ignored. It says, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from the, her dressing room, even the newlyweds. That's not important. The important thing is this sacred assembly. 
in order to uh, repent of the sins of which they're guilty. That is more important than anything, any of the mundane uh, experiences and uh, works of this life. It's more important than that. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Do not give your heritage to reproach, reproach that the nation should rule over them. And this kind of gives an indication of what might happen if they don't repent, is that the nations will invade, invade them, and uh, that's not something they want. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? You know, our disobedience, and of course the disobedience of these people here, brings shame to God. It shames the name of God because God is able to save, but these people reject it. They... Uh, you know, the free will offering of salvation, they reject it, and that brings shame to God among the nations. And uh, why should the people say, that, uh, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? You know, based on your uh, disobedience and the fact of your punishment, you know, where's your God? You know, we don't want to do that to our Father in heaven. So we'll start on verse 18 uh, next week.